Welcome, everybody. I am so excited for this week, and maybe we'll call it uh, the Bitter Truth Week. I am here with my new friend, Rob Lustig, who is um, a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology uh, at UC San Francisco. He is also the Chief Science Officer at Eat Real, a nonprofit dedicated to reversing childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes. Dr. Lustig consults uh, several childhood obesity advocacy groups and government agencies. His books, which are just amazing, include the New York Times bestseller, Fat Chance, the Fat Chance Cookbook, and Sugar has 56 names, a shopper's guide. And his new book is called The Hacking of the American Mind, which is really interesting because I actually submitted a proposal for a book called Flying Blind and the Raping of the American Mind. But then I thought, okay, that's a little over Raping, the top. hacking, you know, it's all, it's all the same. <laughs> so how um, – we actually just met a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. At the I've known about you for a while and I see, I've, I've – Take it, you have known about me for a while, so uh, it was good that we finally uh, actually laid eyes on each other. Yeah, well, it's so funny because you're in line for talking to me, and I see you, and I immediately recognize you from the YouTube <laughs> talk, Sugar, the Bitter Truth. If you haven't watched that, and it's more than an hour, but it's fascinating. It's just literally it'll change your life. Uh, I watched that 10 years ago when it first came out, and now has like eight million views or more and it just changed how i thought about sugar and and about fruit juice in particular so in this podcast so this week we're going to talk a lot about sugar and society and what rob has learned but i want you to tell our listeners and our viewers who you are and why you do what you do oh i'm uh pediatric endocrinologist, so I study hormone problems in children. Um, I started out being interested in why boys were boys and girls were girls from the neck up. I am a neuroendocrinologist, so I was studying how the brain controls hormones, how hormones control the brain, how testosterone causes differences in, you know, brain uh, formation and development, and, uh, you know, what that meant for um uh, individuals and for, you know, various disease states. That's what I started doing and couldn't get funded for it. Well, I was also interested in obesity and I had this one idea back in the early to mid nineties about whether or not the insulin played a role in weight gain. Now, up to that point, people had thought, well, yes, insulin levels are high in the obese, but it's a result of the weight rather than a cause. Well, there is a disorder in neuroendocrinology, which you may or may not have heard of, called hypothalamic obesity. So these are kids who had brain tumors, and because of the tumor, their hypothalamus is shot. Their hypothalamus is either dead from the surgery or from the tumor itself or from the radiation, and they become massively obese. Now, it was around the mid-90s when we had discovered this hormone called leptin. Okay, it was about 1994. And I postulated back then that these kids, because of the brain damage, couldn't see their leptin. And because they couldn't see it, their brain thought they were starving. So you can't fix a brain, or actually, I take it back, you can. <laughs> That's what we do. Okay, here. but back <laughs> then, we couldn't do such and a we good didn't job. Think about it, right? right? We didn't think about it. You know, basically, these kids had, you know, um, anatomic damage to their uh, brain, in particular the limbic system. So what could we do for them? So based on some old work in animals, it would, see, it would have appeared that getting the insulin down by cutting the vagus nerve, and there's a connection between the hypothalamus and the pancreas via the vagus nerve, Cutting the vagus nerve reduces the amount of insulin that the pancreas releases and reduces the amount of weight gain in lesioned animals. So, well, I can't cut a vagus nerve. I'm not a surgeon. So I said, well, can we do the next best thing? Can we give a drug 
that would stop the pancreas from making so much insulin. So we did that. We did a pilot study where we gave a drug called octreotide, which is usually used to suppress growth hormone secretion from growth hormone secreting tumors of the brain, of the pituitary acromegalyris gigantism. But we instead used it to suppress insulin release at the level of the pancreas. And lo and behold, these patients started losing weight. Wow. And no one had ever described weight loss in any of these patients before, but they lost significant amounts of weight. And something even more remarkable occurred that was basically spurred the rest of my career. Not only did they lose weight, but they started exercising spontaneously. Wow. These were kids who sat on the couch, ate Doritos, and slept. And the reason was because their brains thought they were starving. So they didn't want to expend any energy. But when we got their insulin down with the medicine, now they had energy to burn. And so they actually changed their lifestyle. So what this proved, and we did it again in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. We also did it in adults who didn't have brain tumors and found the same phenomenon in a proportion of them. What this proved was that the biochemistry drives the behavior. And this shouldn't be too much of a shock, especially to you. I mean, every thought is a protein phosphorylation. Everything that goes on in our brain is driven by biochemistry, by molecules. Your whole uh, uh, clinic is set up to fix those molecules. Fix the hardware before you fix the software. Right. right. It's really hard to program a brain that doesn't work right. Exactly. So that's what we did. We fixed the problem where the problem was. We fixed the cause rather than the result. And I have basically taken that on, you know, going forward uh, in all of my work, knowing that ultimately sometimes we're smart enough to be able to figure out the cause, sometimes we're not. But it's always upstream of where you think it is. What we're looking at is the result of a problem rather than the cause of the problem. And you have to treat the cause if you're going to be successful. So besides a tumor, why do people have high insulin levels? Right. So that's the big question. Okay. So tumors, I mean, that's like one in a million. Everyone's hyperinsulinemic today. Everyone's insulin levels two to four times higher than it used to be. Now our glucoses are the same, but the amount of insulin that our bodies need to release to keep that glucose the same is two to four fold higher than it was in 1970. And that's where the work that, you know, I delineate in fat chance really came from. And basically, I think it's sugar. The, you know, dietary sugar, the the sweet stuff. And there's a reason for why I think that. Number one, it's gone up like crazy. Number two, the molecule in sugar that makes it sweet called fructose, so Sugar is two molecules, glucose and fructose. Glucose is the energy of life. That's what's in starch. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about fructose. turns out fructose has a very specific biochemical profile. When you consume fructose, say a 20-ounce Coca-Cola, that fructose is all ending up in the liver. The liver cannot handle the load, and the liver has no choice but to take that excess fructose and turn it into liver fat. And it is that liver fat that is mucking up the workings of the liver and is causing that insulin resistance, causing the pancreas to have to make more insulin to make the liver do its job, driving the weight gain. And we have now done several studies to prove that. So when you get the fructose out of the diet, in other words, you cut the sugar from the diet, the liver fat goes away, the pancreas makes less insulin, and the patient loses weight naturally. And the leptin starts working because the insulin was blocking the leptin. So basically, we can reverse metabolic syndrome just by getting sugar out of the diet. So we think sugar is a primary, not the only, but a primary driver of the chronic disease epidemic that we see around the world today. And we are doing our best to try to stem the tide. How can people learn more about your work? So they can get the hacking of the American mind. Sure. But if, I mean, I want you 
I mean, because it's just life changing to go to YouTube and just search for the bitter truth, sugar, the bitter truth with Robert Lustig. Uh, and I want you to get your kids to watch. It. It's, <laughs> it's, and, and it's actually fairly detailed yeah. science, yeah. but you make it easy well, to understand I because you're a really that. masterful teacher. Well, thank you. Um, how else can they learn about your work? So um, I, what I would argue is, number one, th that uh, video is now 10 years old. We have more out that's more recent that I think is actually uh, you know, more up to date and better. Uh, if you do just a YouTube you know, v look on my name, you'll find a whole bunch of them. One's called Fat Chance Fructose 2.0, which I actually think is better although not as many hits. <laughs> There's a TED Talk I did called Sugar the Elephant in the Kitchen. Um, actually, what I would propose that people do is they take three hours of their time and they watch two movies, and they're both on Netflix. One is called Fed Up, which was produced in 2014. Um, and it tells the, it's a documentary that tells the story of how we got to where we are today. Mm. And the other is called Sugar Coated, which is a documentary also on Netflix, which tells the story of why we got to where we are today. That is the corporate subterfuge, the fraud, the public relations campaign to exonerate sugar and make us all sick. So when we come back, we're going to talk about sugar and the bitter truth. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Robert Lustig, professor at UC San Francisco in the Department of Pediatrics. He's a neuroendocrinologist. Uh, and on the Brain Warriors Way podcast, we've talked a lot about hormones because it's very important in our bright minds, mnemonic. Um, and one of the things I learned, I saw this study that showed if you get a sugar burst, it drops testosterone by 25%. And so I thought to myself, if, you know, I go to the cheesecake factory and share cheesecake with my sweetheart, nobody's getting dessert when they get home <laughs> because their no libido's get, not going to be there. I was going to say, no one's getting anything. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the sugar story mm -hmm. and why fat became demonized. Yeah. And sugar became the darling that in many ways ruined our society. I couldn't agree more. Uh, this is a very sordid story and was very specifically driven by the Sugar Association, a trade group uh, you know, the, of, of the industry from way back. Started back in 1943, but really sort of picked up steam in the 50s and 60s. Now, the thing that really turned the tide was 1955. Eisenhower had a heart attack, and everyone wanted to know why. And at that point, the, the data had started to amass that America was suffering from big-time cardiovascular disease. Paul Dudley White at Mass General uh, had demonstrated that the incidence of coronary disease in the United States had gone up something like sixfold over the previous uh, five decades. Wow. So everyone wanted to know what caused heart disease because the president had a heart attack. And there were two camps. One camp, which was led by a British physiologist, nutritionist, physician by the name of Dr. John Yudkin, uh, said that it was sugar that was driving this. And back then, Dr. Yudkin had correlation, not causation. Those studies remained to be done over the course of the next several decades. But he had studies that looked at the amount of sugar consumed and the amount of heart disease, diabetes, gout, um, several other uh, chronic diseases. And he made that case. On the other side, there was a second camp, which uh, unfortunately won out. Uh, and that camp was led by a uh, Minnesota epidemiologist by the name of Ansel Keys. 
He was actually on the court cover of Time magazine, as Scientist of the Year back in 1980. And he did a study which was called the Seven Countries Study. And what he looked at was the percent of the diet as saturated fat versus the incidence of coronary heart disease in seven countries and showed this very linear relationship between the two. Here's the problem. It wasn't the seven country study. It was the 22 country study. He picked the seven that fit his line. The other 15 he left out. Uh, we only found that out later. <laughs> uh, in addition, there were three things that happened in the 1970s that sort of sealed the deal against Yudkin and Four Keys. We learned three things. The first thing we learned was that uh, this uh, molecule in our bloodstream called LDL, low-density lipoprotein. And we learned that LDL was a driver of cardiovascular disease because of these kids with genetic, uh, genetic uh, uh, inability to clear LDL uh, called familial hypercholesterolemia. And these would be the kids who would get heart attacks at age 18. The second thing we learned was that dietary fat raised your serum LDL, which is true. As it turns out, there are two LDLs. It raised one, not the other. And it's the one that didn't get raised that causes the heart disease. But, that, but when you measure it, you measure both. But so we didn't know just that Just so then. people know, LDL is often thought of as A particles and B particles, A, the big fluffy ones right. that are harmless. Right. Basically, B, the little demon ones Small that dense. are like shards of glass yes. that cause That's right. uh, blood vessel damage. Exactly. So we always say LDL is bad cholesterol. It turns out that LDL is actually probably neutral cholesterol in, for the most part. But this one particular species called small dense LDL. It turns out that's what's driven by sugar, but we didn't know that back then. And then finally, epidemiologic studies showed that LDL levels did correlate with coronary disease. So these three things, basically, if A leads to B and B leads to C, then A must lead to C, therefore no A, no C. Get rid of the fat, therefore get rid of the heart disease. And that sealed Yudkin's fate he was thrown under the bus, left to the dustbin as a you know, dustbin of history, and we went low fat, and we went whole hog low fat. The problem is when you take fat out of the food, it tastes like crap, <laughs> okay? I mean, it just does. Food industry knew that. They had to do something to make the food palatable, to make the food worth eating, to make you want to eat it. So what they do? Added sugar. So I took the fat out, put the sugar in. And you can prove this to yourselves right now. If you go to the store, do not buy them. Just look at the food label of snack wells. Okay? They were an invention of 1982. They are still with us. The two grams of fat down, 13 grams of carbohydrate up, four of which are, di are sucrose, dietary sugar. And snack wells drive heart disease. I'm sure Nabisco will not be too happy about me saying that. But that is basically what happened. And it happened to our entire diet. My father got his heart attack eating Entenmann's fat-free cakes. You know, so I have a vested interest in fixing this issue because, you know, my father um, got his heart attack from it. So I understand this issue. And my grandfather, is who I'm named after, who is my best friend when I was a child, um, was a candy maker. And well, he had know. his first heart attack at 49 yeah. and his second heart attack in his 70s that took him away from me. And so I'm genetically loaded for it, but I don't have heart disease. Why? Because I don't eat sugar. Right, because, you, because you're not a candy maker. <laughs> <laughs> and it was hard. Breaking up with sugar yeah. was hard yeah. because yeah. it was attached to love right. when I was a child. Of and course. so often, and you see this, is we love children we praise children we reward children with we sugar. soothe children with, with sugar, sugar which That's is it. just the wrong thing to do i couldn't agree more and if you're listening to this and you're a parent and you bring cupcakes for your kid's birthday at school okay you are the problem okay i'm telling you right now i'm calling all of you out Stop it. Stop it right now. And if any other mother brings cupcakes for their kid's birthday, stop them. 
You're going to be a brain warrior general. Okay. I love that. That's <laughs> decisive. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, why is it from Halloween to New Year's Day, we just are stupid as a society? I mean, why do we celebrate Christ's birth or Thanksgiving Excuse me. by hurting people? Excuse me. Valentine's Day, <laughs> Memorial Day, Easter, Fourth of July, Easter. I mean, it it's it's year round. Okay, this is <laughs> and it's and it's daytime to nighttime. Okay, because what do you feed your kids out there? Breakfast cereal, really? Okay, you want to take a look at that uh, uh, nutrition facts label again? Okay, the seventeen most common breakfast cereals for children are all over 40% sugar, 40%. And, and so the highest happening? Kellogg's Honey Smacks is 56% sugar. You really want to feed your kid a breakfast cereal that is 56% sugar? I mean, like, who would do that? So let me just have a few more minutes with this one. Um, what is happening to the brains of children who get that sugar burst in the morning. And it's not just cereal. It's also waffles and pancakes and syrup, which is just nothing but liquid sugar. And orange juice. And orange juice. Uh, my dad hates us because he grows oranges. And I'm like, eat the oranges, don't juice them. Exactly. Um, eat the fruit, don't drink the juice. And there's a reason for that. But, but what happens in their brains? Because I know if I, because I used to do this, uh, and I am apologize, I used to go to Winchell's on the way to work and get okay. two donuts. And then I learned, oh, you can't do that because a half an hour later, my brain is mud. Yeah. I just can't think yeah. because I get that insulin burst, right. which then drops my sugar level right. and I can't think. So it's, there are probably two different phenomena going on. There's one that's direct and there's one that's indirect. We know more about the indirect one. And that is what you just described. That is you get a big pancreatic insulin burst which then drives your blood glucose down, making you relatively hypoglycemic. Your brain functions on glucose. And when you drop your serum glucose, which is usually around the three to four hour mark, you get a little fuzzy and you get a little irritable and you end up wanting to eat something early in order to bring that blood glucose up. And that could change temperament, it could change cognitive function in school. Though that's one Could potential. it make kids look like they have ADD? Possibly. No one's proven that. There's some correlative, not causative data. That's a tough one. Also, you know, the question is, are you talking about kids who don't have ADD, who act like they have ADD, or kids who really have ADD, who just get worse ADD? You know, there's complications in trying to study that. We There's a little correlative data, but it's not... Uh, uh, for sure. It's not a slam dunk. That's the indirect effect. The direct effect may be even more pernicious. And that is fructose, this sweet molecule in sugar, normally gets metabolized by the liver. But when you eat too much of it, your liver gets overwhelmed. You end up with a serum fructose level. Now, your brain is not designed to metabolize fructose. However, we now know that the astrocytes not the neurons, the astrocytes, the, the supportive, supportive cells. cells of the brain can take up fructose. And when they metabolize it, what it does is it depletes their ATP. And if it depletes their ATP, God knows what that's doing to neuronal function. And so it's conceivable that that fructose bolus that comes when you overconsume sugar might have direct effects on cognitive function as well. We also know that insulin resistance, which occurs not from one sugar meal, but from multiple, you know, over time, leads to brain shrinkage and cognitive decline in adolescence. And this is work of Antonio Convit at the NYU Medical Center, showing that adolescents with metabolic syndrome have bad brain. Yeah, and it goes with the work we've done um, on our studies that show as your weight goes up, the actual physical, functional size of your brain goes down, which should scare the fat off anyone. Stay with us.
Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Robert Lustig. Uh, you had talked about um, two Netflix documentaries that people could watch, Fed Up and Sugar Coat. Sugar-coated. Um, you're all sugar-coated. You're also the author of Fat Chance, the Fat Chance Cookbook, the new book, The Hacking of the American Mind. I hope you're finding this as fascinating as I am. So what's the deal with fruit juice? I mean, everybody thinks, oh, if I can get my kid to right. eat fruit, to drink fruit juice in the morning, I'm a good mom or I'm a good dad. My dad's a grower of right. oranges. And it it's just been thought of as a health food for so long. And then when I watched Sugar, The Bitter Truth, I, I don't think I've had a glass of juice since then. Good. <laughs> as you should. <laughs> So let me uh, try to explain a relatively complex subject. The short answer is fruit is good, juice is bad. Now, you'd say they're the same. And most people think of them as the same. Certainly the USDA thinks of them the same. They consider fruit juice fruit, as simple as that. I would argue that they are not the same at all. The difference between the two is the fiber. Fruit has fiber. Fruit juice has lost one of its fibers. There are two. So whole fruit, and for that matter, anything that comes out of the ground, any carbohydrate that comes out of the ground. Potatoes. Potatoes. Um, egg wheat. Plant. Eggplant. Anything. Comes with numerous nutrients, but two forms of fiber. There's soluble fiber, like for instance, pectins, like what holds jelly together, inulin, which is a very specific uh, uh, plant uh, uh, sh uh, sugar source, uh, uh, storage uh, unit. Um, these are globular. They are soluble in water. Uh, they, it's what Metamucil is, psyllium. So if you add water to Metamucil, you get this gel-like uh, stuff. Okay. So that's soluble fiber. Which you ingest? Right. So even, so when you consume fruit, you're getting the soluble fiber. When you consume fruit juice, you're getting the soluble fiber. But then there's this second fiber, insoluble fiber. So like cellulose, like the stringy stuff in celery, chitins, okay, many other uh, fructans that are stringy. They're long. Uh, they form a lattice work on the inside of the intestine. When you consume fruit, you're getting both of them and you're getting them with the appropriate geometry. And the geometry matters. And I'll explain how that works in a minute. When you make fruit juice, you're throwing the insoluble fiber in the garbage. So you're only getting the soluble fiber. You're only getting one of the two. When you smoothie a fruit, so put it in a Vitamix or a Breville or whatever, you are shearing the insoluble fiber to smithereens. You're cutting it up into little chunks that are so big that it will not do the function that you need it to do, which I'm gonna explain in a minute. So you need the two together. So here's how this works. Imagine that you have a spaghetti colander, okay? Mm -hmm. Metal thing with holes, right? You run water through it. Water goes straight through, of course. Now take a blob of petroleum jelly throw it into the center of the colander. Now run the water. Still runs through. Might bounce off the petroleum jelly, but basically you're going to end up with a wet sink. Now take your finger and rub that petroleum jelly all along the inside of that colander. Now run the water. Now you have an impenetrable barrier. The water won't go through because the petroleum jelly has basically plugged the holes in the colander. Well, that's what's happening in your duodenum, in the first part of your intestine. The insoluble fiber, the cellulose, the stringy stuff, acts like a fishnet. The soluble fiber acts like the kelp that plugs the holes. And together, the two, when you have the appropriate geometry, acts as an impenetrable barrier on the inside of your intestine, thus reducing the rate of absorption of carbohydrate and the various uh, molecules, sugar, et cetera, from getting into the portal vein so that it doesn't all go to the liver. And the whole goal of this is to keep 
the liver healthy by not flooding it. So by cutting back on how fast the glucose and the fructose and the other nutrients reach the liver, you are protecting your liver. And that is precept number one, protect the liver. Now, if you don't absorb it early because you've made this nice fiber gel, that means more of what you ate will go further down the intestine. And what's down the intestine that wasn't in the front of the intestine? The bacteria, the microbiome. And we now know the microbiome is huge in terms of metabolic health for all sorts of reasons, which we can go into if you like, but you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal. You want your microbiome fed. And the point is that if you didn't absorb it early, that means you're feeding your microbiome later. So even though you consumed it, even though it passed your lips, you didn't get it. Your bacteria did. So even though you counted it as calories because it passed your lips, it doesn't count as calories because the bacteria chewed it up, not you. And you fed your gut. So those are the two precepts to determine whether something is healthy. Protect the liver, feed the gut. If a food does both, and fruit does both, it's healthy. If a, fruit, if a food does neither, that would be like a soda, it's not healthy because you're flooding your liver and starving your gut. If a food does one or the other, but not both, like for instance, fruit juice, then it's halfway. And that's what the data show. The data, the empiric data on fruit juice and diabetes or fruit juice and heart disease or fruit juice and mortality show not as bad as soda, but clearly not as good as any other non-caloric beverage. So fruit juice is not good just not as bad as soda. So important. I mean, what, what an important message. And then when you read the labels, fruit crystals and organic grape juice oh, yeah. is, it's just everywhere that fructose, and you had said it earlier, it's because that's the sweet part right. of the sucrose Exactly. Molecule exactly. is fructose. Exactly. So, and, and, and is there a difference uh, between high fructose corn syrup and regular corn syrup? Well, yes, there's a difference between high fructose corn syrup and regular corn syrup. The question is, is there a difference between high fructose corn syrup and sucrose or table sugar? And the answer is no. So high fructose corn syrup is cheaper and it's homegrown and... Iowa is filled with corn. Got to do something with it. 17% of the corn crop each year is turned into high fructose corn syrup for sweetening this, that, and the other thing. It is so cheap that it found its way into virtually every other food stuff that we buy at the store. Whoever heard of salad dressing have sugar, having sugar? But go check your commercial salad dressing. The only way you get salad dressing without sugar is if you make it yourself. It's just that simple. Or McDonald's grilled chicken. Has sugar. Absolutely. I'm like, why does it have sugar in it? There are only and seven items at McDonald's that don't have sugar. Ready? Um, uh, French fries. But actually, I've heard that back in the day, they actually did add sugar because it browned the French fries better. But I think that they've stopped doing that now. Um, number two, um, the sausage does not have sugar in it. I was surprised. Chicken McNuggets do not have added sugar, but the dipping sauces do. So they're really not, uh, that's not a good <laughs> one either. Um, uh, hash browns, for the same reason the French fries, they don't have sugar. Um, and after that, it's uh, iced tea if you, add, if you don't want, if you say no sugar, coffee if you don't want sugar, and water. That's it. Okay, everything else at McDonald's is loaded with added sugar on purpose for their, per for their reasons, not for yours, because they know when they add it, you buy more. Well, and I think of fast food basically as fiberless food. That's right. That way you can go in, you basically don't have to chew it, you just swallow, swallow it, it and right? then you go out. So they get more turnover. Absolutely. Uh, people. So I'm going to tell you a so funny story. I'm, let, me, let me just tell you a funny story about how important fiber is. So I live in San Francisco. I have lived there twice. I lived there when I was a fellow back in the early 80s. And then I moved back in 2001. So two separate times. When I went to a Chinese restaurant in San Francisco the first time I was there, every 
restaurant had brown rice because brown rice was good for you, right? Then I left and I lived in New York and Madison, Wisconsin and Memphis. When I came back to San Francisco, no restaurant had brown rice, only white rice. Now, when I lived in New York, there are plenty of Chinese restaurants there. They all had brown rice. But when I came back to San Francisco, they'd gotten rid of the brown rice. They only had white rice. Now, why is that if it's healthy for you? I have no idea. Because in San Francisco, they charge for the rice. And in New York, the rice was free. And the restaurateurs in San Francisco realized when people ordered brown rice, they only ate half a bowl. But when they ordered white rice, they ate two bowls because the fiber was satiating. Whereas in New York, they were perfectly happy for you to have brown rice because it was free. So why would they want to give you two bowls? So, you know, it's funny, along that line, you know, have you ever asked yourself, why, when you go to a restaurant, do they give you free bread? And the first thing they ask you is what alcohol beverage can I get you? Absolutely. Because both of them lower frontal lobe function. Uh That bread causes an insulin spike, which Mm -hmm. drives serotonin, which drives tryptophan into the brain. Mm -hmm. So it actually makes you happy. Mm -hmm. It's the don't worry, be happy chemical. (laughs) And so even though you go in and go, I'm not going to order dessert, I'm going to be good. I'm going to stay on my diet that as soon as you get the bread, the diet's out the window and alcohol drops your frontal lobes. So they're very strategic on how to get more money out of your credit card. There is no question about how strategic they are. They've got it down. And and, And the point is they know and you don't. When we come back, we're going to talk about the hacking of the American mind and what's really going on in our society. And you're going to find how similar it is to my new book, The End of Mental Illness and the Evil Ruler. You've heard me talk about if I was an evil ruler. How would I create mental illness in America? Dr. Lustig is going to help us with that. Stay with us. Welcome back. I am here on the Brain Warriors Way podcast with Dr. Robert Lustig. I am so grateful to you and your work. I Likewise, uh, you you have helped me personally, so uh, I I owe you a debt. Well, that is just a joy for me to to share our work with you. Um, And when your book, The Hacking of the American Mind, came out. It sort of reminded me of the Brain Warrior's Way. You know, we wrote, my wife and I wrote the Brain Warrior's Way because it's everywhere we go. Someone is trying to put a gadget in your hand, shove bad food down your throat. You get this toxic look at the news and it's like you're in a war for the health of your brain and your body. You need to become a warrior armed, prepared, and aware to really be able to win the fight of your life, which is for your health. Indeed. So the subtitle of this book is The Science Behind the Corporate Takeover of Our Bodies and Brains. And that is exactly what is going on. There has been a corporate takeover, and that is what I describe in the book. Now, specifically what I argue in, you know, in scientific detail is that what has happened and the reason why this is a war is because our society has very specifically with conscience with a conscious intent confused and conflated two separate terms so that we don't know the difference those two terms are pleasure and happiness so there are seven differences between pleasure and happiness. What are they? I'm (laughs) dying to know. All right, ready? Number one, pleasure is short-lived. Happiness is long-lived. Two, pleasure is visceral. You feel it in your body. Happiness is ethereal. You feel it above the neck. Number three, pleasure is taking. Happiness is giving. Number four, pleasure is achieved alone. 
happiness is usually achieved in social groups. Number five, uh, pleasure can be achieved with substances. Happiness cannot be achieved with substances. Number six, the extremes of pleasure. Now, whether it be substances or behavior, so substances like cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol, sugar, all the stuff that does bad stuff to your brain, as you've shown. And to your families. And your families. Or behaviors, shopping, gambling, internet gaming, social media, pornography. Those are all behaviors. There's an aholic after every one of those because ex excess of any of those hedonic substances or behaviors leads to addiction. So we have shopaholic, alcoholic, chocoholic, sexaholic, etc., and right down the line. Whereas you can't overdose on too much happiness. And number seven, the reason for the book, pleasure is dopamine, happiness is serotonin. So two different neurotransmitters, two different sets of receptors, two different areas of the brain, two different regulatory patterns. Like, why do we care? They both feel good. Why do we care? And most people substitute one for the other because pleasure, you can buy. Happiness, you can't. Pleasure is cheap. Happiness is tough. So why wouldn't I want to substitute one for the other? Here's why. Dopamine is excitatory. When dopamine is released from one neuron to the next, it excites that next neuron. That's its job. Dopamine excites the next neuron. Now, neurons like to be excited. That's why they have receptors. But neurons like to be tickled, not bludgeoned. They like to stimulate, then they like to come to rest. Chronic overstimulation of any neuron anywhere in the brain or in the spinal cord or in that matter in the gut will lead to neuronal cell death. So it wears it out. It wears it out, right. And we know this because we take care of kids in the neurointensive care unit who are in status epilepticus, you know, nonstop chronic seizure sores. And we have to stop their seizures as quickly as possible, put them into a pentobarbital coma if we have to, in order to preserve brain function. Because the longer those seizures go on, the stupider they're going to be. So it is a priority to stop the stimulation. So chronic excitation leads to neuronal cell death. Dopamine causes chronic excitation. Dopamine kills neurons. Excessive dopamine. Excessive. Dopamine Over kills a long, a chron chronic excessive dopamine kills neurons. Now, the neurons, they don't want to die. So they have a fail-safe. They have a plan B. They have a self-defense mechanism. What they do is they downregulate the number of receptors. So it's less likely that any dopamine molecule will find a receptor to bind to. So what does this mean in human terms, in terms of addiction? You get a hit, you get a rush, receptors go down. Next time you need a bigger hit to get the same rush because there are fewer receptors and then the receptors go down. And then you need a bigger hit and a bigger hit and a bigger hit until finally you need a huge hit to get nothing. That's called tolerance. And then when the neurons actually do start to die, that's called addiction. And those neurons ain't coming back. They don't regrow. So dopamine leads to addiction. When it's overstimulation, excess, overstimulation, yeah. chronicity leads to addiction. Serotonin, on the other hand, is inhibitory. So if it's inhibitory, it puts the next neuron to rest. Now, if it's going to put the next neuron to rest, is there any chance of wearing it out? No. So does serotonin downregulate its own receptor? No. So you can't overdose on too much happiness. But there's one thing that downregulates serotonin. Dopamine. They counterbalance each other. They do. But, and so, so, but the more pleasure you seek, the more unhappy you get. But let me, let me give you a different take on this. Because um, I've thought about this a whole bunch. That if we scan you, and you have sleepy frontal lobes. And psychiatrists won't know because they never look at the brain, but they give you an SSRI, which boosts serotonin. It'll actually make you worse because it'll take your sleepy frontal lobes, make them sleepier, 
which then will disinhibit you and cause all sorts of behavior problems. Um, well, in it, fact, we know that if you give SSRIs to the wrong patient, they will jump off roofs. Or kill their mother or, or do all or something sorts else. of bad things. Um, three, it works for three quarters of the patients, and it doesn't work for the other quarter. My experience, not three quarters. Okay. But because uh, de depression's just not one thing. That's right. right? Depression sometimes is not one thing. Overactivity, That's sometimes right. it's overactivity, sometimes it's underactivity, sometimes it's trauma, sometimes it's toxins. For sure. um, and in my book, Feel Better Fast and Make It Last, I talk about the dopamine drip versus the dopamine dump. Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed to treat a number of uh, young celebrities. And fame is a dopamine hit. Absolutely. When they recognize you, when they want your autograph, when yep. the paparazzi follow you. Yep. And, and over you, time- And you know as well as I do that fame wastes a lot of people. It, it does, because it wears out their nucleus accumbens. Totally agree. And, and the other thing that wears it out is obesity. Mm -hmm. That the people, they go after the dopamine hit with the cupcakes that mm -hmm. we got after moms for bringing to school. Yep. And the more they do it, uh, the more treats, really the less cells for dopamine to feel right. anything exactly. at all. And exactly. one of our- It changes the game. So, you know, ultimately we have been so plied with sugar that if you tried to get the sugar out of the food, it would taste terrible. And so that maintains and, and the level- And people get withdrawal from and, sugar. And they do. And also the um, T1CR receptor on the tongue for sugar goes down because of all the sugar in all of our food. So you end up needing more sugar to be able to get any sweet taste. So we have basically desensitized our taste buds and our reward center, which basically keeps us coming back for more. And if you can stay off sugar just 10 days, your taste buds begin to come back. They do. And when you eat an orange, it will explode with flavor in your mouth as opposed to if you're eating a lot of sugar, the orange tastes like nothing right. to you. And so being a brain warrior is you really do see sugar as the enemy. And we're here. We love to talk about food and loving food that loves you back. And that would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> so many people are just in a bad relationship with, with food. Well, it's easy to get in a good relationship with food. Two words, real food. Food that came out of the ground or animals that ate the food that came out of the ground. That's real food. Anything else is processed. If it has a label, it's a warning label. Because real food doesn't have a label, does it? Because oh, it doesn't that. need a label. I love that. In so, addition, if any food has five ingredients or more, leave it at the store. Because that means it's processed. Do you know corn dogs have 29 ingredients? I did. <laughs> Pop-tarts have 36. Oh, isn't that insane? It's the insanity. Robert Lustig, professor of pediatric endocrinology at UC San Francisco, the author of The Hacking of the American Mind, the science behind the corporate takeover of our bodies and brains. How scary is that? Also in the documentary, Sugar Coated and Fed Up, uh, I, I hope you just get his books, look at the documentaries. This is going to arm you, prepare you to win the fight of your life. And what did you learn in this week of podcasts? Um, write it down. Um, put it on any of your social media sites, hashtag Brain Warriors Way podcast. If you want to win a signed copy of the Brain Warriors Way cookbook, leave a review either on Apple or on brainwarriorswaypodcast.com. Also leave your questions. Thanks so much for being with us. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics, 
or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.